In late May of 2020, when the death of George Floyd sparked outrage across the United States, it seemed like every major corporation wanted to join the conversation, including Apple, Twitter, Sony, Amazon, Nike, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Verizon, Adobe, Zoom, T-Mobile, Nintendo, Slack, 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 You get the idea. At one moment, all of corporate America was trying to respond to this moment of anti-black racism. But there was one company that really just, their statement just stood out among the pack and that was Ben & Jerry's. It wasn't just nice platitudes, it was actually legislation that they were calling for. But it's interesting, if you go on Ben & Jerry's Instagram page or Twitter account, they're constantly talking about these issues, and it's not just when they're prompted. It's part of their actual mission. What's going on is genocide. And that mission has been the cornerstone of the brand for over 30 years. Burn I, I, I will me, tell you. Burn <laughs> me, burn me, burn me. But does Ben & Jerry's, which in the year 2000 became a subsidiary of a multinational corporate conglomerate, really care about social justice? Or is it all just a clever way to peddle more pints? Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Jerry. You know, we may not have the money to go on TV for 30 seconds, but we sure do make some of the best ice cream you ever tasted. Look for us on top of every pint. In 1978, when lifelong friends Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield opened their first ice cream shop in Burlington, Vermont, the brand wasn't focused on activism per se. We never called it a social mission, but the business was values driven from the, from the earliest days. I don't know that we were hardcore hippies per se, but we certainly believe in peace and love. So when we started as a little homemade ice cream shop. Our idea was to be a little corner store that would be a community gathering place. They would donate free ice cream to nonprofit organizations, people who were using the ice cream to have celebrations or for fundraising events. Uh, the policy was not to turn down anybody. They were basically social justice activists who had stumbled into making ice cream and found that they had a lot of success at it. And as the years went on, they became more and more skilled and excited to push various kinds of social causes. Our feeling at the time was that essentially, business is a machine for making money. And that if we wanna be of as much service to the community as possible, what we need to do is give away as much of our profits as possible. And so we started the Ben & Jerry's Foundation. The Ben & Jerry's Foundation would fund community organizations and local initiatives helping disadvantaged groups across the country. And the foundation was to receive 7.5% of the company's pre-tax profits, which was the highest percentage of any publicly held company. The corporate average is around 1.5%. I said 5%, Ben said 10%, and we settled on 75 and you know, the investment bankers, you know, they were in disbelief because even 5% to them made no sense. And soon, the founders began integrating their activism into products, like Peace Pops, a popsicle that would fund a new anti-war charity, an idea which in itself caused some conflict. There was always a tension on the board of directors between those who wanted to really commit to pursuing social justice objectives and those who said, no, really, what we got to do, first of all, is make sure that we do a solid uh, financial job of selling ice cream, that we have good profits. But over time, the guys and the business tried to figure out how to incorporate the values of the founders more into the day-to-day -day business decisions. And uh, that was a real evolution over a long period of time uh, with some arguing back and forth and some struggles, but eventually led to the creation of a mission statement that's based on this concept that was called linked prosperity. The idea behind linked prosperity is that as the company prospers, everything and everyone it touches will prosper. The company would have three goals and the goals were equally important and making a profit was only one of the goals. The second goal was making the best quality ice cream possible. And the third goal 
was making a significant commitment to social justice and the prosperity of the communities uh, that Ben and Jerry served. But the linked prosperity concept wasn't entirely new. The executives of businesses in the 50s and 60s were considered members of the community and their businesses were expected to support their communities and they were looked down upon if they did not participate as leaders in the lives of their communities. High up in a tower in midtown Manhattan are the offices of an unique organization devoted primarily not to making money but to giving it away wisely. This started to change really in the late 1960s, early 1970s. The change in attitude was highly identified with an economist named Milton Friedman. I'm pleased to present the number one selling book in America, Free to Choose. Please welcome the Nobel laureate in economics, Milton Friedman. Right. Here. And Milton Friedman's position was that the purpose of business is to make profits. Um, if you do anything else besides making as much profit as possible with your business, you're doing it wrong. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that. I studied that, you know, in college and as an MBA. I didn't believe it then, and I certainly don't believe it now. I mean, I never envisioned the integration of a social mission into a business the way uh, that Ben did. I mean, I think he was really visionary. But in my mind, and, I, and certainly in Ben's mind, uh, there's no way for uh, a business to really be truly successful if it's just focused on, on making money. Uh, it needs to be mindful of its other constituencies, uh, its employees, its immediate community, the broader community, even the world. And um, I think Ben and Jerry played an, an integral role in hopefully putting to rest uh, Milton Friedman's famous quote. Cementing the company's priorities allowed Ben and Jerry's to integrate more social activism into the company's day-to-day -day operation, like sourcing fair trade ingredients, even if it meant paying higher premiums, partnering with socially responsible suppliers, like a bakery in Yonkers, providing jobs to formerly incarcerated and low-income residents, campaigning against artificial growth hormones for cows, supporting LGBTQ rights, promoting environmental justice, and more. It was really about fairness and justice and standing up for people whose voices are often not heard. And that's, you know, pretty different from a corporate approach. But I think making ice cream allows us to talk with people and connect with people about serious things in a pretty fun way. As you give, you receive. As you help others, you're helped in return. As your business helps the community, the community supports your business. Now, that generated, you know, a lot of favorable press. Uh, which we think, you know, contributes to people wanting to support and buy Ben & Jerry's ice cream. But it didn't originate uh, from people sitting around in the marketing department saying, hey, you know, how can we uh, generate some more press? Still, over the years, the values triad, product, profit, and community, proved to be a difficult balance to maintain, especially with increasing pressure to compete with other super premium ice cream brands. As the company grew larger and larger and the profit margins grew smaller and smaller, more of the shareholders of Ben & Jerry's began to uh, question the company's commitment to spending extra money on things like employee benefits and charitable gifts and special arrangements with suppliers in tropical countries. As a publicly held company, um, you know, if, uh, if your stock price is not moving up, um, and you become an attractive takeover, you're susceptible to that. There were a number of businesses that, you know, expressed an interest in the company. Ben and Jerry and a number of people on the board did not want to sell. And they fought with the other directors for 18 months, but they eventually lost because not selling would have meant laying off probably 40% of their staff. So they decided to sell to Unilever. Unilever, the multinational consumer goods conglomerate, owns Axe, Dove, Lipton, and about 400 other brands. The board was able to negotiate a very unique deal in which a unique Ben & Jerry board would remain 
and they would have a say in uh, who the CEO that Unilever put in place was and uh, Unilever committed to continue to donate 7.5% to the Ben & Jerry's Foundation. And then there were some very uh, dark years when Unilever really didn't manage Ben & Jerry's very intelligently and uh, Ben & Jerry's has sort of lost its way. But about 10 years ago, Unilever and Ben & Jerry's renegotiated their relationship and Ben & Jerry's was allowed to fully recommit to the three-part mission. So when that happened, um, Ben & Jerry's really took off. And I think the company is about four times as large in terms of sales now as it was when Unilever purchased it in the year 2000. The Tonight Show! Some of the concepts that Ben & Jerry spoke of early on that investment bankers, you know, just, you know, went white at are now part of the vernacular in how businesses operate today, uh, you know, from the Fortune 500 on down. Earlier this month, Ben and Jerry's announced their support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter members say they question supporting businesses who don't take stances against oppression. There's a lot of data that shows that customers are really looking for brands and companies to respond to social activism. And there was one stat that really stood out to me, that two thirds of Gen Z really look towards the brands and how they respond to Black Lives Matter and the way they react will permanently decide how they spend with them in the future. I think the company was able to speak out so strongly and so clearly because it had been doing the work. And so that led up to the George Floyd murder and the company being able to say, we must dismantle white supremacy. One of the most wonderful things is that we had nothing to do with it. People probably don't realize Ben and I work at the company, but we're not involved in the management. We're not involved in operations. We're kind of, pretty faces, you know, we're Ben and Jerry. And the company came out very strong and it was wonderful. Uh, you can imagine how proud Ben and I are that the company is, is doing things like that.